Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church, Mount Pleasant, Iowa. Um, Mary Beth, Janet, we are back from Synod School and we are all energized. Yes, yes, yes. okay. That's what Synod was good. Um, we uh, have several things to share with you. Uh, for the rest of the year. Um, but we want you to know we thank you for your prayers for safe travels. And um, we had a good time. And I have several pictures that I will share with the congregation when I get them developed. Okay? Are there more announcements? A couple of spaghetti dinner reminders, announcements. The ticket packets are in the office, and you can pick them up there. And then uh, we wrapped silverware this morning in the lounge at 9 o'clock. We had coffee and donut holes. And we're, we're not doing that next week because we'll be at the park, but we'll do it the week after. So I guess that would be the 17th. If we don't finish that week, we'll do it one more time. But I think we'll, we'll be able to. So you just come in. You can, it's a sit-down job. We socialize, have a little snack, and it's fun, and we get something accomplished. So anybody who would like to, feel free to join us on the 17th at 9 in the morning before church. Good morning. I was just going to come up real quick and remind you that it's the Deacon Food Drive this month of August. Sacks are out in the foyer. But then I opened up the Hawkeye this morning and saw this article. It says National Geographic includes Iowa in the new, new face of hunger. And it uh, features a family from north central Iowa, the uh, Dreyer family. And I'm just going to read a couple pieces from the author. It says the author of the piece, Tracy McMillan, wrote... The fear of being unable to feed their children hangs over the dryer's days. She and her husband, Jim, pit one bill against the next, the phone against the rent, against the heat, against the gas, trying always to set aside money for what they can't get from the food pantry or with their food stamps. She also says it's a cruel irony that people in rural Iowa can be malnourished amid forests of corn stalks running to the horizon. I think that says it better any way better than I could. Um, you will find there are two lists on the sacks out front. One is for the general pantry items. Both agencies wanted to help children in the area with school supplies. So there's also back to school list. A little bit of both, all of both, two sacks, whatever you guys can do would be greatly appreciated. Thanks. Good morning to y'all. Good morning. Hey, I have a couple uh, worship announcements for you. Uh, we continue in worship to invite you to share um, the ways that you've experienced God, uh, to share your prayers, uh, to share the photos uh, of those experiences with the holy, the sacred, the other uh, in your daily lives. Uh, to do that by either uh, filling out, writing a little note on the sheet of paper, which I think is kind of a beige piece. Yes? Is that right? Am I right? Okay. And placing it in one of the baskets uh, that are in the back of the sanctuary or uh, by sending um, a photo to Kathy. And I think the, uh, her address, email address, is in your bulletin this morning. The other way uh, to join in prayer as a community of faith is to take a moment uh, today uh, during the worship service, whether it's um, as you leave or as you come or leave from communion. Back in the back, you'll see candles. Do you see them back there? They're kind of, it's really pretty the way they've got that set up. But if you'd like to light a candle uh, as a way of offering prayer, a prayer of thanksgiving, or a prayer of concern, need for someone or for yourself, please take a moment uh, during worship today and light one of those candles. The second thing is to remind you that next Sunday we won't be here, will we? No. Is that right? Yeah? Okay. Just making sure everybody 
We'll be out at the park for worship. I'm sorry I won't be with you, but uh, have a great Sunday out of the park. I'm sorry to miss it and to miss being with you. The other thing is to let you know that our opening hymn is one of those hymns that have been chosen by you uh, as one of your favorites. It is unfamiliar to me and maybe unfamiliar to you, but for somebody, it is very special and important. And so I invite you to, to sing along. I'm going to ask Marlene to play it through once before we sing it, like we did last week. And we'll continue to expand our repertoire. We'll be singing everything before you know it, won't we? And enjoying it as well. The last thing is a reminder that today is Communion Sunday. Uh, we celebrate communion at an, what we call an open table. That means that all who trust in Christ are invited to come to the table to share. We'll be doing that by intention, which means we'll invite you to come forward um, to take the bread and then to dip it in the cup and go ahead and partake. Come as you are ready. Leave as you are finished. Uh, leave from communion as you are finished. Feel free not to come. We're not, we don't have ushers to excuse you row by row. Just come as you're ready. Okay? Come as you're ready. Great. Thanks. Please stand for the call to worship. All who are thirsty, come. God is the for our All who are hungry, come. Jesus feeds us with goodness and grace. Rich and poor, young and old, neighbor and guest, come. The call to reconciliation. The Lord is not mean-spirited or vengeful. God is gracious and merciful, always willing to listen to our prayers and to hear our hearts. Let us join in the prayer for forgiveness, saying, we are sure we do not have enough to end hunger in our communities, holy God. 
Forgive us that we forget that by your presence and power. Very little can do so much. We believe we are the only ones who carry heartache around with us. Forgive us compassion's heart that we do not see or embrace the despair of those around us. We think we do not have the words with which to offer hope and healing to strangers. Forgive us, welcoming God, for not having the courage to run up to them with your grace. We convince ourselves that we need to devote all our time, our energy, our resources, our lives on keeping up with others. Forgive us for not living a joyful, gracious life modeled for us by you, Jesus, our brother. Listen, come to the one who covers us with compassion, who feeds us on grace and mercy. What good news. Everyone who thirsts is given water. Everyone who hungers is fed. Everyone who sins is forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm doing a lot this morning. Sorry about that, but I signed up and then I signed up and then I signed up and I forgot when it was. Um, this morning, uh, I'm going to sing for you a song by, made famous by Twyla Parrish, uh, Paris, um, How Beautiful. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty road and the hill to the cross. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. How beautiful the heart that bled, that took all my sin and bore it instead. How beautiful the tender eyes that chose to forgive and never despise. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ, and as he
Just as he died, willing to pay the price. Willing to pay the price. How beautiful the radiant bride who waits for her groom with his light in her eyes. How beautiful when humble hearts give the fruit of pure lives so that others may live. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ, how beautiful. Open your Bibles and follow along as I read from what we believe to be the Holy Word of God, truth for our lives and living. Our reading this morning comes from the third chapter of Job. Job is not only the name of the book, but it is the name of the book, this is the name of the man who this book story revolves around. Early in the introduction, in that very first chapter, we learn a few things about Job. We learn first, he is a man who fears God. That doesn't mean that he sits in a cave and cringes, waiting for God to come and get him for something he did or did not do. It means that Job has a great deal of of respect, a great deal of awe. For God. That the relationship between Job and God has integrity to it. We also learn that Job is very blessed. He has oxen, lots of oxen, so many that he needs servants to care for him. Not only does he have oxen, but he has donkeys. Not only does he have donkeys, but he has goats and sheep and camels. Can you imagine that? Camels. He has camels, and he has these servants that take care of all of his property and possession, make sure that everybody has water and food, but his greatest blessing of all is his children, his sons and daughters who have grown. And then we are told, In a moment just like this, Job loses everything. The donkey, the oxen, the goats, the sheep, the camels, the servants, his children. And if that wasn't enough, 
Then we are told that, that from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet, Job is covered with loathsome sores. Job's response and what we're reading this morning is grief. It is his initial grief response to all the loss. If we live as human beings, we too are going to experience loss. Think about the infant. Their first experience with loss is is when mom and dad say you can't have your binky anymore. You got to put it away. You can't take your blanket out of the out of the house. And what do they do? They cry, don't they? Loss is a part of the human experience and with loss comes grief. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about grief and grieving. And we're going to begin by listening to Job's cry as he experiences the loss of his property and his prized possession of his children. Let us pray. Be with us here in this time and this place, O oh God, so that we might feel you close. Be, be here with us in this time, in this place, so that we might be open to your word for us. This is our prayer in Christ. Amen. After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. Job said, let the day perish in which I was born and the night that said, a man-child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it or light shine on it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let the clouds settle upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let Thick darkness sees it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Yes, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry be heard in it. Let those who curse it, let those curse it who curse the sea, those who are skilled to rouse up the Levathon. Let the stars of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none. May it not see the eyelids of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb and hide trouble from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire? Why were there knees to receive me, or breasts for me to suck? Now I would be lying down and quiet. I would be asleep. Then I would be at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who rebuild ruins for themselves, or princes who have gold, who fill their houses with silver. Or why was I not buried like a stillborn child, like an infant that never sees the light? There the wicked cease from troubling and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners are at ease. Together they do not hear the voice of the taskmaster. The small and great are there. And the slaves are free from their masters. Why is light given to one in misery and life to the bitter in soul? Who, who long for death, but it does not come, and, and dig for it more than a hundred treasures, who rejoice exceedingly and are glad when they find the grave. Why is it light? Why is light given to one who cannot see the way who God has fenced in? For my sign comes like my bread and my groanings are poured out like water. Truly, the thing that I fear comes upon me. 
and what I dread befalls me. I'm not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. This is the word of the Lord. To begin a conversation on grief and grieving, we have to begin with talking about loss, don't we? Loss comes in all shapes and sizes. It's not all equal in, in, in what that loss amounts to, what it, what it represents for the one to whom the loss occurs or comes. There's the baby and the binky, but there's the 10-year-old who puts on the brave face, goes out and greets the other team after losing, and then sits in the car and mopes all the way home. Just as much a loss as any other loss. There is the teenager who, who loses a sense of where do I fit? How do I belong in this world Where is my place? And they struggle as they try to find what is lost. We call it sometimes the innocence of childhood. There are the losses of relationships. We we seek to have significant relationship with others. Maybe we think they're going to be close friends or, or maybe even people we will spend the rest of our lives with and it doesn't work out for some reason, somehow. There's a loss of hopes and dreams. We envision a future for ourselves and, and it never comes to fruition. I was going to play baseball for the Cardinals. It just never happened. There's the loss that comes with aging. For some reason, even though I'm about to turn 55, I still think I'm 25. Do you know what I mean? I can't do the same things with my body, but my mind still thinks. I can. And of course, there's a loss that comes with death. The death of a loved one a friend, a neighbor, someone whose life has been some way connected to our own. To begin a conversation about grief, we have to begin with understanding what is lost. This is what Thomas Adage says when he talks about grief and grieving. In his book, How We Grieve, Relearning the World, The interesting thing about loss, especially when we think about the loss of a loved one, at least in this example, is that it's not as simple as it seems. Because it's not a single loss. It's a multitude of losses when a loved one dies. There's a physical reality to it, isn't there? Those of you who have had spouses die, you know this better than anyone. You turn around, you expect your spouse, even though they have died days, weeks, months ago, to still be there. There's a physical reality, seeing that person, touching that person. We go to grandma's house. We still expect her to come around the corner to see her smiling face greeting us with arms wide open. There's a physical reality, but there's much more that is lost, isn't there? Sometimes we call it the loss of companionship. Sometimes we call it the loss of conversation. We miss being able to rehash our days with that loved one. To have somebody to bounce ideas off. You can't do that. My wife would say to me, you cannot go out of the house wearing that. (laughs) You know what I mean? If she were to die before me, where would I be? 
The loss that we face is not a singular loss, but it's a multitude of loss, the loss of companionship, the loss of help. A man's spouse dies, and he gets up on the ladder to change the bulb, and he all of a sudden he realizes there's no one there to hand him the new bulb, to take the old bulb from his hand. It's just a simple example, but it happens in a multitude of different ways. The woman who goes to the gas station to fill up her car and, and realizes she's not sure exactly how everything works. It's true. So when we experience a loss, regardless of that loss, it's not just a singular loss, but it's a multitude of losses. And as we think about grieving, we have to think about all the things that have been lost at some point along the way. It doesn't come in a minute. It doesn't come in a moment. But over time, if we work at it, we begin to identify what has been lost to us. And that will help us in our grieving. A mom dies young. She's survived by her children. Her children grow up. They get married. They have children of their own. And each and every event that is significant, mom's absence is present. We have to recognize what is lost. Let me back up a little bit, or at least come to the side for just a minute to recognize the work on grief and grieving of Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Her initial book written back, I think it was in the 70s or early 80s, was on death and dying. Maybe you're familiar with it, maybe you're not. But she, she um, kind of came up with five emotional responses to the end of life, to death and dying. And later she carried them on to grief and grieving. Because you know dying is really about facing, grieving the loss of one's life. And these five emotional responses, she said, are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Those can be helpful to us to experience the emotion. The little boy back in the back seat of the car after losing the game he, um, he, he, he pokes at his sister. He wants to make sure that she is just as miserable as he is. He's letting out his anger. It's not a healthy way to do it, but that's what it is, isn't it? Denial comes in a lot of different ways and different forms and, and ways to us. Just like me telling you, well, I'm going to turn 55, but I still think I'm 25. That's a form of denial, isn't it? That I'm aging, that I'm getting closer to death. A lot of times people who are grieving will say to me, I just can't believe he's gone. Or even closer yet, maybe, they'll say, I don't know why hospice is here. I'm really not dying. Denial is not a bad thing. I want you to hear this clearly. Denial, anger, uh, bargaining, depression, they're not bad things. They're coping mechanisms, ways in which we make our way through the, 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 the plethora of events of grief. They're not bad. They're bad when we take our anger out in the wrong way. Okay? Depression's bad when we get stuck in it. Denial can help us get into the next day. It can give us the rest we need to face the harsh reality. These things aren't bad things. They're important things. Cooper Ross helps us to understand some of the emotion, but it's attic that helps us find a way to work through our grief, I think, more fully. You see, for, for Cooper Ross, she says that these emotions don't come linearly. We don't start with denial and then go to anger and then to bargaining and then to depression and then to acceptance. She says that it's like a whirlwind sometimes. 
that one can come before the other. I might accept in one moment that my loved one has died, and in the next moment I might say, I wonder when they're coming home. Cooper Ross tells us that these emotions come like the waves of the ocean. There's no stopping them. They just come. And all we can do is be prepared for when they come. But Adage says that in grief, we can be attentive to doing work that will move us forward through the emotion. So he says you've got to start by acknowledging what has been lost. And then he says, you have to navigate the no man's land. I love this image. What's no man's land? It's a place that we've never been before. Think about it. Think how death or a significant loss changes everything. If I lose my retirement and I've been planning all these years for it, and here I am on the threshold of retiring, all of a sudden my whole reality has changed. And now I must walk forward into this place that is not known to me. We have to recognize what has been lost, who has been lost. And then we have to begin navigating the no man's land. It's scary out there. We don't know what it is. But we know our world is changed and we have to find ways to get from what it was to what it will be. All the time we carry our loss with us. We never let go of the significance of what we have had and what we have hoped for or who has been significant in our lives. But yet at the same time, we're learning to live in a world that is significantly different. My grandma died at 102 years old. She died on Christmas Day. Last year, I went to St. Louis for the first time in about 12 years. It's the first time in my lifetime that we did not have Christmas Eve with my grandma. First time in my lifetime. We had to learn to celebrate Christmas without her there. We, we started new rituals, new routines that acknowledged her, her place. They set a chair up in the living room. They put a box of chocolate on it. Nobody could eat because Grandma loved her chocolate and she loved her wine. Navigating the, the no man's land makes us take risks to learn how to live with the absence of what has been lost. The wife who has lost the spouse begins to, to, to take and figure out how to get the car taken care of. She calls her son and she realizes he's no help. And then she calls a friend Little by little, she gets to this place of feeling more and more like she can handle. Like what she had lost in the help that her husband represents and will always represent can be managed in a new way, in a different way. At the end of this grief journey, Adish says, is learning to live holy. Holy. That means with a sense of well-being. Well-being that acknowledges what has been lost, but at the same time has allowed us to relearn our world, to learn to live in a different way. Scripture is, is full of stories of loss. It's full of human beings like you and me grieving. It tells us stories of God grieving for us. 
expressing the sorrow. But the amazing thing is, is Scripture is also filled with hope. Over and over again, it reminds us that from loss comes new birth, comes something new, comes a new way of being. It doesn't leave our history behind us. But I think the way the Bible puts it is that we become a new creation. No better place represents that than this communion table. Think about it. Jesus is about to go to the cross. He knows it and he's told his disciples and he shares one last meal. And he takes bread and breaks it. And he says, this is given for you, my body. He takes the cup and he pours it out. He says, this is given for you. Because there's going to be a tomorrow and a day after that and a day after that. And we are going to live as God's new creation. Transformed by bread and cup. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Our hymn of response is number 527. As you are able, if you would please stand. Please be seated. Ask not this day, what do I have left over that I can give? But what abundance have I been given that I can share? Let us receive this morning's offering.
Let us pray. May our gifts quench the thirst of those who desire hope. May our lives be spent in feeding those whose hunger is all too real. May we always give away the blessings you have given to us. God of the compassionate heart. Amen. Page 513. <laughs> You may be seated. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. Scripture tells us the people will come from the east and the west, the north and the south, and they will sit together at the kingdom at this table. According to Luke, when Jesus' apostles, his disciples, were deep in grief at his death, Jesus broke bread, and in the breaking of the bread, they recognized him. Their eyes were open, and their hearts were filled with new hope. The invitation is to come to this table, to experience the comfort, the mercy, the love, and the hope of God in Christ as this bread is shared and this cup is given. Let us pray. We come this day, O oh God, to this table to offer our gratitude, our thanks, O oh God. Because before there was, you were, and you opened your hands. And the rivers flowed through the deserts of delight. You spoke a simple world, and the universe was born. It was filled with beauty and diversity. It was filled with wonder and awe. And your breath dwelt in the midst of all of it. And we, too, are part of your creation. So we thank you for the joy of being a part of what you have given birth to. We recognize, O oh God, that as you created this world and you gave us life, that you gave us the responsibilities of care for our environment and for one another. And we know that we don't always do what you ask us to do. 
but patiently as a parent you would send people, others, to call us back to your ways. And finally, you showed us how to live in Christ Jesus. We thank you for Christ, for his life, for the ways he showed us how to be generous, to be filled with hope, for the comfort he brought to us in the midst of our grief, for the ways he welcomes us into the family. We thank you, too, for the gift of your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, who brings us comfort in the midst of our grief and points us forward, transforming our lives into that new creation. We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit now to dwell upon us and this gift of bread and cup so that the bread we break and the cup we pour might be for us a communion with the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Make us one with Christ and all who share this feast. Unite us in hope, encourage us in love, inspire us to be your glad people in every time and place. We pray this, and we join together in the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from this kingdom. Amen. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was to be arrested, he sat at table with those he loved and he took bread and after giving thanks he broke it and he said to them, this is my body given for you. Do this, remembering me. And in the same way, he took the cup and he said to them, this cup, it is a new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Do this too in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim hope in the midst of death. For these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This time I would invite the communion servers to come forward. As we are ready, uh, make ourselves ready, we invite you to come down the center aisle, if you will, take a piece of the bread. Uh, dip it into the cup and partake as you are ready. If you'd like to offer a candle in prayer, please know that the candles are in the back there and there are lighters uh, as well. The body of Christ, the cup of salvation. Come, for all is now ready.
Will you join now in our unison prayer of thanksgiving? Lord Jesus Christ, you have put your life into our hands. Now we put our lives into yours. Take us, renew, and remake us. What we have been is past. What we shall be through you still awaits us. Lead us on. Take us with you. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 293, as you are able, if you would please stand.